Welcome to this video on sustainable economy in which I want to work out especially the connection between exergy and energy, the exergy especially to use used to quantify the energy demand of the future. This video is part of a video series on our successful future in which I want to talk about different aspects that are relevant for our sustainable future as humanity in well-being for everybody. The questions that I want to answer are shown here. How can energy be evaluated if the future energy system is unknown? We don't know how that will work out, how that will develop, is the sustainable energy change? And which consequences then actually result? First of all, I should mention that the uh, video is based, or the slides that I show are based on publications, uh, mainly with Philip Frenzel, who did his PhD thesis with me and he worked out all this exergy business with respect to the chemical processes that I'm talking about. Well, what is exergy and why is it relevant? Well, first of all, one can very generally say exergy is that part of an energy stream that can be freely converted into something useful, into something else, into equivalent other energies. So the energy that we have consists on the one hand side of that con freely convertible exergy and the so-called energy. How to explain? Well, in order to explain that, here's an example shown. If you have steam at different pressure levels, so superheated steam at different pressure levels, that's the energy carrier that you have in chemical industry, for example. That's quite frequent that you have st uh, steam at different pressures. And compare that to electricity. Then you see in blue is the exergy, so the, and the energy for these three cases is identical. You see that the electricity, that's 100% exergy, you can do anything with that. Heat something up, drive a motor or whatever. And you can freely convert it into anything, so that's pure exergy. On the other hand side, steam on different pressures has different contributions of exergy. The higher the pressure, the higher is the contribution of the exergy. The rest is not to be, cannot be really used and accessed. That there may be energy contained somewhere that cannot be used for anything becomes obvious if you look, for example, at a tank with, a, say, a cubic meter of water, which is at ambient temperature, then of course it contains the energy at that temperature, sure. But you can't do anything with that because there, you, there's no process that will, will allow you to drive, for example, a motor just because you have in a vessel with some, uh, some water at ambient temperature. If the water on the other hand side would be at 1000 degrees centigrade, then you could do something with that. And you could drive a steam turbine with that, for example. Just a cool example, of course. So that's why it makes sense to talk about exergy as a useful part of an energy. On the, now one has to observe on the one hand side that energy is of, cons, of course conserved, that's a fundamental physical law. Exergy on the other hand side may be lost in processes. So the usefulness of energy can get lost in the processes. Well, if it's used for something, that energy then of course afterwards it's gone, you have did something with that and then you can't use, and use that energy for anything else anymore or lower grade things only, presumably. Also, it is nice that there is a connection between cost and exergy. If you evaluate the price for the different energy carriers, so electricity, steam at different levels, also crude oil and sugar in that case, you always find quite similar contributions economically. At that point where that study was made, the price was between one and two euro cent for all of these cases per megajoule of exergy. And looking at the steam, you see that actually, if you relate it, so to speak, to this little fraction here, it's that in, in that range, if you would, con on the contrary, um, associate that to the overall energy content, the price would be much less and it would not be comparable. So it becomes comparable if for different energy carriers you relate it to exergy. And that's why it makes sense to talk about exergy, because they're directly independent of the energy that you use, the energy carrier that you use. You're always talking more or less about the same cost for the energy, and that, of course, is something is, which is relevant for future development. Now I should work out a little bit more for uh, what exergy actually means, how it's calculated. These are the equations that, that were used by Philip Frenzel in his thesis and in the publications. And this relates preferably to the exergy of a material stream. 
that material stream has mainly three contributions. It's a chemical contribution, a physical contribution and a uh, contribution due to, due to mixing of the different components. So these are the different components of which that mixture consists and there is an exergetic contribution for the mixing. That mixing part relates to the entropy of mixing and as the thermodynamicist among you may guess that's a minor contribution. Uh, the chemical contribution on the other hand side that stems from, from the elements more or less and that describes so to speak how the um, chemical component is built up from the elements. So that describes how much energy is, or exergy actually, but how much energy is finally contained in the chemical bonds of that component. Of course expressed as exergy with a free energy as you can see here for those who know a little bit how that works. The physical exergy on, us, on the other hand side, that is this com uh, contribution, can be expressed like that and it depends on the pressure and the temperature of that stream, that material stream we are looking with respect to the environment because that difference with respect to the environment can be used in steam turbines for example. Um, the U uh, describes in this case the environment. So one can on the other hand say, side say that this contribution is only large if the temperatures and pressures are sort of extreme. So several hundred degrees above environmental temperature, high pressures of several hundred bars, then this is really a significant contribution. Otherwise, in most of the cases, for ordinary processes, the chemical contribution is the highest contribution in this equation. So it makes sense only to look at this chemical contribution first. Now let's do it. In order to do that, we plot this chemical exergy in megajoule per, per kilogram four different types of materials classified as fossil field feedstock, biomass, intermediates and products. We see for the fossil feedstock coal, crude oil, methane, natural gas and of course hydrogen as well. And then the other groups. Now what stuck, uh, struck us was actually that if we start out from crude oil to ethene, so ethylene, to polyethylene, that is more or less horizontal. And we ask ourselves, is there a reason for that? Does that have to be so or is that just accidental? Because as you see, of course, different products, different polymers specifically, have exergies on very different level. And also, for example, glucose, so uh, sugars, have a very low chemical exergy. And that, now the question is, of course, what do we learn from that? And do we learn from that that this fossil process is running more or less horizontally? In order to investigate that, Philip Frenzel actually worked out an example that explains a little bit how it works. He assumed a chemical reaction between a component A and hydrogen to form component B at not at more or less ambient uh, temp uh, conditions, slightly increased temperature, uh, pressure and ambient uh, temperature. So there is a reactor where the hydrogen and component A are entering. Then some reaction occurs to component B. He assumed that's an equilibrium and we can describe and, and the equilibrium is really reached. So the catalyst is perfectly work working. Then in a flash uh, evaporation, you remove the hydrogen, recycle that back into the reactor. And then afterwards you have only components A, a and B and you separate them by distillation and recycle the A so that, ca that can go a second round, so to speak, through the reactor until everything has been reacted. Of course, here you need a pressure de uh, decrease possibly, here you need a pressure increase again. So these recycle streams all relate to some additional energetic effort that is required on the one hand side. Secondly, if one looks now at the reaction, one can see that the conversion uh, of component A in that general hydrogen hydrogenation process um, the conversion with respect to component A as a function of that uh, driving force, the free energy of reaction, which is actually at ambient condition exactly the chemical exergy, that that, or the exergy change across the, uh, the reaction of course, that that uh, conversion decreases significantly if these values are positive. So if the free energy after the reaction is higher than that before, then this gives positive values, which also means the chemical exergy after the reaction is higher than before. 
then the conversion approach is zero. If it is negative, then it's approaching almost the value of one. So everything is converted and there's a transition function in between, of course, connecting the two limiting cases. Now, of course, if the conversion is low, you have to separate a lot for the recycle streams. You have to have significant recycle effort. And if you evaluate that exergetically, so the exergy losses now, again, as this function of the free energy of reaction, you see that these exergy losses in megajoule per kilogram of the product are relatively low here. One megajoule was one to two euro cents, so it's essentially nothing. But as that is increases to positive, that is exponentially increasing. This is a logarithmic scale. This is a linear behavior. So it's an exponential increase. If you want to move upward with respect to free energy, which means exergy. And that's actually why it is quite natural that the chemical processes always work horizontally, because then actually you are somewhere in this range and the exergy demand for the process for this chemical reaction is, stays limited. You get good conversions, equilibrium conversions, everything works out fine. So it's understandable that from crude oil via ethylene to polyethylene it's more or less horizontal. Which means, on the other hand side, if we start out from glucose, it's to be expected that we are working ho uh, horizontally as well. And that we start out here and move then to polyethylene, that that is actually quite unlikely, because that means that we have to put energy into the system. Now, how can we put that energy into the system? Actually, how would that work? Well, in order to realize that, one has to observe that the um, free energy of reaction is, of course, the overall free energy of reaction. All products, all reactants accounted for. So the net change in free energy, or which is the same if the reaction occurs at ambient condition, as the change in chemical exergy. So we need to regard the net reaction. And to just give you an example, if uh, you have glucose fermentation, you start also with glucose, you produce ethanol and you produce CO2 at equal mass ratio. And if you evaluate that overall, the net reaction, so the individual components is from here to there and there. If you evaluate that with the corresponding mass average of the or a molar average of the corresponding values, well, it's mass average because it's here in kilograms, then you would wind up somewhere here and would, you would have a net reaction which has a slightly downward slope, which means, of course, well, the microbes, they are living happily from this slightly downward slope because they gain exactly that little bit of energy, or exergy, if you like, that they can use for their, their uh, living processes. So we have to regard the net reaction. That's one thing that we have to uh, see. And of course, that means putting in energy into something can mean that we add, for example, hydrogen, because that has a very high exergy, add hydrogen to something. So if we look, take glucose, add hydrogen to that, that will shift the overall exergy of the, res of the resulting thing in upper direction. But of course, hydrogen has to be produced well in a sustainable energy environment presumably by electrolysis, where the electricity stems from photovoltaics or wind energy. So that way we can put in energy by um, adding that hydrogen. Now if we look again at this diagram, uh, we can also look at that uh, with respect to uh, per uh, carbon. In order why that is relevant, let's again look at the last diagram, this one. Because here we see actually that the, um, the, if you observe that actually, if you look at the different levels that we have, it may occur to you that the exergy is lower if the components contain more oxygen. So the, low, the higher the oxygen content, the lower the chemical exergy of that component. And that means, of course, that if we, on the other hand side, look, so to speak, at the exergy per carbon, then that will possibly level out a little bit. And that's actually shown here. So this is now the chemical exergy in megajoule per moles of carbon or megajoule per mole where there is no carbon present, for example, for the hydrogen. And there you see now that everything is more or less horizontally, much closer by a, a level like that. So conversion between these things, just taking into account the carbon, will be more or less horizontal. But that means, on the other hand side, that actually, if you want to go to these things, you may lose the oxygen uh, from your starting material. And that, of course, is 
decreasing the mass of your product. So you can go in this direction, but only if you, but you have to keep the, the carbon in, in your system, but you may possibly use your oxygen. That's one aspect that also may be taken into account in these exergy relations. Now, based on that or keeping that in mind, I also would like to look at a different diagram that has been prepared actually by uh, some co-workers as well. Others were involved, so it's published here, but there are also other people who were involved in the original de derivation, for example, Sarah Payas. Um, and the idea is to plot the uh, concentration somehow of the carbon, oxygen and hydrogen um, in the different components and see how that matches, so to speak, between the products and the raw materials. In order to show that in this diagram, which is a ternary diagram, where each point in the diagram indicates, so to speak, how much carbon, hydrogen and oxygen is contained in the corresponding molecule, the closer it is to the corresponding corner, the more of that component is contained. And we see that coal, crude oil and natural gas are more or less on this horizontal line containing only carbon and hydrogen, essentially hardly any oxygen. And we see that the chemical products, which are shown as these big uh, circles, the polymers mostly, and where the size of the circles corresponds to the production, the global production rate of the corresponding component, that these circles fit quite nicely to the feedstock, to the current feedstock in the chemical industry. So products and feedstock not, uh, match quite nicely. On the other hand side, we see that the bio-based feedstock, starch, cellulose, of course sugar as well, hemicellulose, lignin or oleic acid, as one example for a plant-based um, plant oil product, that they contain significantly higher amounts of oxygen which means it is to be expected, taking these previous diagrams into account about the exergy, that it is to be expected that more oxygen will also be contained in future products because our feedstock, if we shift to from fossil-based resources to bio-based resources, which is one of the few chances that we have, that then actually the products will contain also significantly more oxygen. Examples for that are, for example, this uh, polylactic lactic acid, which is one of the most famous and very early on developed bio-based polymers that is very nicely produced sort of, uh, from, uh, from glucose, for example. So it is to be expected that the fraction of such polymers that are richer in uh, oxygen, that that will increase. And another example of uh, some containing some poly uh, oxygen is the PET, which is the plastics used for plastic bottles for uh, carbonated drinks to a, a large degree. Of course, we can also ask ourselves, well, if you want to change the different, uh, the oxygen content, what can we do? And actually, there are a few options available. On the one hand side, we can, well, they are shown here, so to speak, we can remove CO2 from the molecule. But that means, so that reduces this, the oxygen, but also withdraw or, or strips off one carbon. And we have happily collected the carbon via the biomass from the atmosphere, so losing the carbon is not nice. So that would be a way to go somewhere down here and to re uh, reduce the oxygen content, but since we lose the carbon, that's not really attractive. Secondly, we can strip off the, hydro the, the water, water molecule, um, which is possible as well, but that leads, that points more or less into the corner of the, of the pure carbon that is we wind, wind up with coal, with a solid more or less. This is not desirable as well. Another option is to play around with the hydrogen more or less, strip off water, but add also some hydrogen. And then we go, so to speak, in the right direction. Of course, you can uh, do, do similar things, so to speak, with carbon dioxide sometimes. So these things are more likely to occur that we have um, uh, hydrogenation and dehydration, that these are the typical processes that, that will occur in processes if you want to get from these biobars based mat starting materials down to the conventional polymers. This also we can keep in mind and use that to sort a little bit the processes that are discussed and that can be observed in the literature proposed for the future chemical industry. Now, based on this exergy 
keeping these reactions in mind, we can also come up with certain, well, process descriptions. And actually Philip Frenzel did that in his studies and evaluated if we start out with different feedstock, which is mentioned here, and produce different polymers from that polyethylene, PET and polylactic acid, um, how well do the different things perform, the different roots perform? Well, if we start off, of course, from crude oil to polyethylene, this is a big process, and there we have actually quite easy, uh, it's the exergy that we lose in that process, so the price that we have to pay for that, the exergetic price that we have to pay for that is quite low. And they actually sub uh, subdivided the overall exergy demand on the one hand side with respect to the footprint corresponding to the raw material, the chemical exergy change across the process and the utilities that are used to run the process, so for distillation, for example, for getting the reaction at the right temperature and things like that. And there you see actually polyethylene, it's very nice to do that from crude oil. If you want to use glucose instead, the, the exergy demand would be significantly higher, which also means that the price would be much higher. So doing polyethylene from glucose is possibly not such a good idea. You can do it, but it's not such a good idea. On the other hand side for PET, crude, crude, uh, he compared crude oil and two different routes starting out from glucose and you see that actually that's not so much different. This is only some eurocent difference between that, so that is manageable. So PET can very well be produced from glucose in principle. Exergy wise there's nothing contradicting any uh, the direct use of that or production for, of that from glucose. Today crude oil will be a little bit cheaper but possibly not too much in the future. Depends of course on the crude oil price in the end. Finally, if you want to go for polylactic acid, the price or the exergy demand is decreased as compared to PET, of course contains more oxygen, and actually the price is not so different or the exergy demand is not so different as compared to the PE from crude oil. So that's a good substitute possibly for the future development for polymer production in the future. So we see actually keeping the oxygen in the final product is quite beneficial with respect to all aspects that we have. Of course, with respect to the mass balance, so we have more mass of the polymer, and of course also exergy-wise. Now, there is of course, if I say that, typically there's a complaint directly by the polymer scientists because they tell we don't sell polymers by the mass, but by function. But actually you have to realize that some of the high performance polymers, they are containing quite large quantities of oxygen, like PET for example is containing a large fraction of oxygen. Polycarbonate, one of the strongest polymers that we have more or less, contains lots of oxygen. So the performance is actually not that bad. And actually in consumer goods, which are a large fraction of the, where the polymers are used for, they have to have a certain, I should I say, mass, a certain weight, a certain thickness, because otherwise the consumers wouldn't use it. So if you have an arbitrarily strong polymer, which you use only in very thin layers, and that is actually sufficiently stable, consumers wouldn't use that. They have to have a certain mass. So you have to buy, you have to sell also a certain amount of mass, so to speak, of the polymers. It's not just function. Okay, keeping that in mind, we see actually that more oxygen-containing polymers are foreseeable in the future and polymers are the largest products in chemical industry. Now, actually with the exergy uh, picture, Philip Franzel went even further because he realized that actually you have three different levels of oxygen contained in the molecules which relate, in the biobased molecules, which relate directly to the three levels of exergy. And he showed that more or less in this diagram. So this is the chemical exergy versus the mass fraction of oxygen in a wide variety of components. And three levels that he distinguished with respect to oxygen was the crude oil level containing no oxygen, the plant oil level containing only a little bit of oxygen, and the glucose level containing significantly more oxygen. And the idea is now to investigate how a general process shifting the components from one level to the other, how much exergy they would use in order to estimate which are the possible routes for bioeconomy in the future. In order to do that, he regarded the different options that exist and they are spelled out here. So of course we have the 
levels from glucose to glucose, from fatty acid to uh, fatty acid. We are only talking about the bio-based things. And again, he has taken into account the different contributions. First of all, the feedstock contribution. And there we see actually that for the fatty acid to fatty acid, the contribution is higher, simply because the footprint, the energetic footprint of producing the fatty acids is higher as compared to glucose. Simply the, the tons of fatty acids that you can produce from rapeseed, for example, is much uh, lower compared of, with respect to the energy that you have to put in, uh, much lower as compared to the glucose, so the efficiency of the production of the fatty acids on the land area and correspondingly the energy that you need to for your agriculture is, is less efficient as compared to uh, starch production and from that then the glucose. So for that it looks as if you if you keep all the oxygen in your molecule you go for that because that's the easiest case, cheapest case with respect to exergy. Of course you can then shift that from the glucose level to the fatty acid level or even to the crude oil level that would correspond to producing polyethylene from glucose and there you see that the demands with the different reaction possibilities that we discussed previously they are much higher as the direct conversion into something that contains large fractions of oxygen. You can directly see how that, so to speak, behaves. From the fatty acid uh, thing we can do of course the same. You can go from fatty acid adding more oxygen. Then this of course comes down because the mass is increasing. On the other hand side, fatty acid to crude oil, that's so to speak better than from the, crude, uh, from the glucose to the crude oil level. So if you want to have a product finally from on the crude oil level, then it's beneficial to use plant oil-based uh, processes than uh, as compared to using glucose-based processes. But again, possibly these differences are so small that they are not really so too dramatic. Okay, so that allows you to estimate a little bit which um, process options are optimal, the most optimal cases. So the best thing is to keep all the oxygen in the product and wind up with and start out with glucose. The second best option uh, is to use the, uh, the fatty acids, so plant oil uh, based products. And on the other hand side, if you want to wind up with crude oil based or components in the end that are not containing any oxygen, so like the crude oil based processes today, then you should better start out with the fatty acids and the glucose will give you only a slight, uh, it's, it's only slightly worse, so that may be, this difference may actually be a question of technology after all. So how well the things work out. On the other hand side, one can also evaluate how much land area is required and that is actually something which is quite relevant if you want to, again, link back, so to speak, to the video on the competition between food production and biomaterials production. These are the same routes and one sees the land area which is required for the biomass production and there one can see actually that the biomass per obtained a certain quantity which is then used by the people afterwards as plastics is again best of course if you start out with the glucose fatty acid to fatty acid increases that somewhat and if you want to go from fatty acid to crude oil the area demand is increasing significantly. So again, also with respect to area, it's good to have lots of oxygen in the product because then you have minimized, of course, the area demand. On the other hand side, there are very large variations which stem from the different scenarios that are accounted for. I don't go into the details of this. You can read that if you like in the corresponding publication. Um, one can say on the other hand side that the area demand that is required the minimum area, which is, well, if you take the lower, lower ends here, so to speak, and somewhere some central value here, then actually, this is for 2050, something a little bit less than 500 square meters per capita appear to make sense. That appears to be a reasonable value. Comparing that to the overall land area that we have available by 2050, um, that is a significant contribution. So this will actually pose problems in competition with the, uh, with the food production, as is worked out in the corresponding video on this exactly that competition for the land area between food production and biomaterials production.
With that, I would like to summarize the results. XRG has been shown to be a universal measure for the energy demand and it's independent of the energy system that you use, completely independent of that. For the bio-based economy, one should take care to avoid carbon losses because it has carefully been collected from the environment, from the air by the bio biomass. And also one should try to keep the oxygen in the products because that again increases the mass, otherwise you only lose mass, um, as we have seen. That actually means also a challenge for the chemical engineers because higher oxygen content means that there are strong intermolecular forces occurring, hydrogen bonding, bonding polarity of the molecules increases, which decreases the vapor pressure, pressure and increases the viscosity. So these shifts are in the physical properties of the systems we are dealing with at, as chemical engineers are to be expected. Also, have, uh, I think one thing I, didn't, I don't mention here, but which is I think also quite important, I've given you uh, some framework into which to consider the different options that are dis currently discussed for a big bioeconomy. You can link that somehow with the diagrams I've shown with respect to exergy, as well as this triangular di diagram with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. With that, I would like to say thank you, and I hope to see you again in one of the other videos of this video series.